from um, algebra 1. So the set of inputs for a graph is called the domain. You probably know that. And the set of outputs is called the range. All right, so inputs are your x's here, and your range of outputs are your y's. All right, now I'm going to show you two ways to write your domain and range data. Two different we call them notation. And depending on who you had for algebra one, you might have seen one of these before. But fourth period, they said they hadn't seen it. So the first is called interval notation. And I'll talk about what the different parts of the interval notation mean in just a second. But it could look something like this. A square bracket, negative 2, and so there's a comma, maybe 7, and then a parenthesis. Have any of you seen something like that before? Yeah? So some of you have learned it, some of you have not. Um, another example would be parentheses, negative infinity, comma, infinity. You kind of remember this? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it just depends, because fourth period, people, nobody had said they all were like, no, I haven't seen that before. But, so it really depends who your teacher is. Now this notation, we'll talk more about this in a minute, but negative infinity to infinity. So these interval notations are um, sets of numbers, where the smallest number is on the left, the bigger number is on the right, and it, it means that it includes every number in between. So this would be every number from negative 2 to 7. This would be negative infinity, so the smallest infinity, the numbers go negative forever up to the biggest negative numbers, or positive numbers, I'm sorry. And another way to think about that is you probably heard something said called all real numbers. That's the interval notation for all real numbers. That means any number you can imagine is in the set. Okay? So there is a way, and I'll do this one right now, to write all real numbers in this other notation called set notation. Now, set notation is a really formal mathematical way of writing things with symbols. Alright, so set notation uses a curly bracket. The curly bracket in math means a set. You probably did that with probability last year when we did sets for like rolling dice or that um, set of the possible answers you get when you roll two dice or something like that. So you have a set. Now if we're talking about, say we're doing domain, what letter represents domain? X's. So this means this is a set of all the X's such that, that's what that line means in math, such that x is in, this is called an epsilon, it looks kind of like a little e or a claw, x is in the set of all real numbers. It's a bold-faced r, so it's like two lines and then the r. That's the, the set notation way of saying negative infinity to infinity, or all real numbers. And we'll look at what this means like visually in a couple minutes. But that's kind of poofy, right? There's, all, there's actually, if you take theoretical math, so if you decide to go into engineering, or be a mathematician, or math teacher, or physics person, anything like that, um, you'll actually learn, you'll take classes that use these kind of symbols all the time, and you can do like whole sentences in math. Like, this means and, this means or, I think this one means not. Like, there's all kinds of in, all kinds of symbols. There's like tildes, and there's arrows, and then there's double arrows. You can do all kinds. You can like write a whole sentence using just spooky symbols. So that's one set notation. Another example, what we typically use set notation for is, say we're doing range, so this would mean all the y values, such that, and a lot of times you'll see an inequality symbol within here. So you might see a symbol that looks like all right, so there might be a compound or regular inequality in the set notation. That's typically what we use set notation for in for inequalities, and I'll show you that in about 15 minutes. Okay. Right now we're going to focus on interval notation for the first couple minutes, and we're going to use graphs. So the first half of the notes are just looking at graphs, and the next half of the notes is going to work with some equations. So we have this graph here on the right. Can you tell me, by looking at the graph, what is the minimum or the smallest x value? Negative 3. Yeah, so the smallest x is at negative 3. And what's the maximum x value? 6, right over here. So my x's go in between those pink lines, from negative 3 to 6. So we have this interval notation we can use to write that. Now at negative 3, there's a closed dot there, right? There's a dot on the end. So when there's a closed dot, we use a square bracket. 
and put that left X and within the square bracket. And then this graph continues, there's X's, there's X's, there's X's, until we get to X equals 6. And there was another closed dot, so I put a comma, 6 with brackets. And that's the interval notation for the domain of that graph. All right, now I do the same thing for the range. So the range is from the bottom. What's the lowest y value here? Negative 5. So I'm going to skip the right and min and max part here, but negative 5 has a closed dot on it, so it gets a square bracket. My range is from negative 5 up to what's the highest y value here? 4. So 4 also has a closed dot, so it gets a bracket. That interval from negative 5 to 4, notice I went the smaller number first, bottom to top, will be the range. Now this graph is what we call continuous. What do you think continuous means? It what? You probably weren't wrong, I just didn't hear you. What does continuous mean in general? It never, well, not maybe never end, well, yeah, maybe never ending, but it doesn't, like, have a break in it, right? So what continuous in math for graphs means, if I put my pencil on the leftmost part, I can make the entire graph without picking up my pencil. So if you have a continuous graph that has no break in it, interval notation is really helpful. The bottom of this page is an example of a not continuous graph. You see a bunch of ordered pairs. Could you plot all of these ordered pairs without picking up your pencil? No, so it's not continuous. All right, so what we're going to do is let's list the ordered pairs here. All right, what points do you see on your graph? Negative 3, 3, what else? Negative 2, 5. Negative 1, 3, and then 1, negative 1. All right, so I have four points on this graph. Is that graph a graph of a function? Does it pass the vertical line test? I think it does. And if I drew a line through any dot, it would only go through one dot. So this is a function. Is it a one-to-one -one function? No, what x value or y value breaks that rule? Three. So this is not a one-to-one -one function. All right, so, side note, if I graphed this inverse, the inverse of this graph, would its inverse be a function? No, because it's not one-to-one. -one. Right, that was on that quiz question yesterday at the bottom if you want your inverse to be a function, the graph has to be, it has to work on line test. It has to be one to one. Um, domain. So my domain is the set of what numbers? The x's or y's? X's. So when I have just a set of points here, I'm not allowed to write an interval this time. If I wrote an interval, don't write this down because it's not right. But if I wrote an interval from negative 3 to 1, which is my smallest x to my biggest, what that interval means is any number in the world you can imagine between these two numbers is on the graph, including something like 0 0.5. But does 0 0.5 here have any value on my graph? No. So you can't write an interval because it doesn't include all the numbers. So what we do for points is we do set notation. And we say, oh, that was not right. There we go. I'm looking for domain with the x's. So my only x's on this graph are the x coordinates from these ordered pairs. You would say only the x's that equal negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, and 1. Those are the, that is the domain, those four numbers. That's the only x value you can have for this graph. And then we do a similar thing for the range. We say, okay, my range is all the y's. What are the only y values on this graph? 3, what's another one? 5 and negative 1. And that would be your range, those only y values. Make sense? All right, we're going to practice a little bit more with the notation. Flip your page over. Let's do a little bit more with graphs. We're going to talk a bit about this graph, and we'll do a bunch of examples. So this graph is the equation x squared minus 2x minus 3. <coughs> and let's find the domain and range. So domain. Um goes left to right. I'm going to fill in part of the box as we go here. The domain from our graph goes from the left to the right. Right? Go along the x-axis. So if I look on the left end of this graph, it's hard to see a little bit, but there's an arrow there. 
Where's that arrow going to the left? That's it. Negative infinity. Now, when I do infinity for interval notation, I have to use a parenthesis because infinity isn't a number. It's just this concept that we go negative forever. On the right, if I go to the right here, what's on the right? Where does it? An infinity. It goes to infinity. So my domain here is negative infinity to infinity, or we can say all real numbers. The range has to be read from bottom to top. Right? We have to go, when we write inequalities and do in the last place here, from smallest to biggest. Okay. We can't write the biggest number first. Generally, when we do things, like when we write this down, we write the smallest and then the biggest. Left to right, how you read things. So, if I start at the smallest, which is the bottom, what y value is that at? Negative 4. Now, there's not like a an arrow or an open dot there. So I put a bracket. I'm including negative 4 in the domain, or in the range, I'm sorry. But there's arrows on the top, which means the graph goes up forever towards infinity with a parenthesis. So always look for, the last blank is the arrows. If you see an arrow, your graph, or your, the domain or range is going to have an infinity. All right, let's look at a bunch of graphs here, for example. Bringing back some other vocab just to make sure we remember it. Uh, a, is that a function? No. Is it one to one? Oh, I wrote, yes, that's not right. No and no. All right, even odd or neither? Neither. Right, not well, it is symmetric, just not across where we want. Um, domain. So, so for A through C, we're going to do um, interval notation. So my domain here, what's farthest to the left? Negative 1. So I put a square bracket, negative 1. And my domain goes all the way across until 7 with a square bracket. Uh, my range. What's on with the lowest y? Negative 5 with a square bracket. Then I go to the top to 3. Now, you use a square bracket when there's a closed dot. If there was an open dot or an arrow, that's where you use the parenthesis. Uh, let's look at B. Is this function one to one? Is or I'm sorry, it's it's a function and it's one to one. I'm sorry, I skipped that. So it passes the vertical and the horizontal, even odd or neither. Odd. That's a parent function. What parent function is that? Y equals x. Good. Okay. So y equals x is a parent function. We're gonna see this again in about five minutes. Um, what's the domain of this graph? I have an arrow on the left and an arrow on the right. Negative infinity to infinity. All real numbers. That means for this parent function, I can think of any x value in the whole world that I want and put it in there for x, and it'll work. What is the range of this function? Same thing. Negative infinity to infinity. So if I put any number in the world that I want into the function, I can get any number I want. Okay, so all real numbers. That's a nice graph. Last one for interval notation. Is this a function? No. Is it? Can it be one to one if you're not a function? No. It does pass the horizontal line test, but you can't be one to one if you're not already a function. Um, even odd or neither. Ooh. Odd means reflected across the origin. This is reflected across the x, which is actually neither. We don't have a name. It is symmetric, just not over the y-axis of the origin. So that's neither. Um, what's my domain? Where's the left, left most x? Zero. So I have a square bracket at zero. And how far to the right can you go? Towards infinity with a parenthesis. Now range here. On the bottom, I have an arrow. So we're going down toward negative infinity and up to positive infinity. Now the next three graphs, I think they're mislabeled. It's supposed to be D, E, F, but um, we're going to do set notation. So is this one here, is this a function? Yes, is it one to one? Is it even odd or neither? How do you know it's even? Reflect, reflect over the y-axis, yep. All right, domain. What's happening on the left? If I go this way forever. Negative infinity, and my right is to positive. All real numbers again. What about the 
arrange. This time I start on the bottom. What's on the bottom here? Negative infinity. And how high up does the graph go? Four with a square bracket. Oh, I didn't do set notation. I don't know. I was on a roll. I'll do it real quick for you. So my domain here, I use x. Now, this was the one where I used the, that epsilon, that in, so we said all the x's in, that's epsilon, it's a Greek letter, in the set of all real numbers. Sorry, I forgot about that notation. Um, and then the range, I'll scoot this up a little bit for a minute, would be y such that. Now, are all the y's, when I look at the graph, bigger or smaller than 4? Smaller. So I would write an inequality that says all the y's, are less than or equal to 4. I don't typically put in, um, infinity in inequality. That's a lot, a lot of i's right there. I don't put infinity in inequality. So I would say all the y's are below 4. That would be my special notation. All right, the next one here. Is this a function? Yes, is it one-to-one? -one? Even odd or neither? Neither. Okay, domain. So I have my curly bracket. I'm looking at my x's here. What's my leftmost x? 1. Now, for this set builder, I have to write an inequality inside the parentheses. So I'm going to put a 1. Now, there's a closed dot at 1. So I'm going to use a less than or equal to symbol. My x's are in between 1 and what number? 5. Well, what symbol goes with the 5? What inequality here for the open dot? Just less than. Now let's make look because it's open. If I did interval notation, I would have a print. All right, and then what's the range? For my set notation, y such that. Where's my bottom y? Zero. So it has a closed dot again, so it gets less than or equal to x. And what's my highest one? Okay, and 6 has a closed dot up there. That's not where the open dot is, so that would be also less than or equal to. That one's a little bit trickier. Wait, what? Yeah. Why is there a line on that? It should be, yes, you're right. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Oh. That should also be a Y. No, that shouldn't. That's <laughs> Too much stuff going on. Okay, the last one. Is this a function? No. no. Is it one to one? Is it even odd or neither? No. I did this on purpose, actually. This is odd. If you graph y equals x here, see how those reflect? This is actually, I graphed all those points because they're inverses of each other. This is actually an odd function. I did that to see if you were paying attention. Okay, so it's odd. So set of points, all I have to do for my set notation is list the x value. So I have all the x's such that x is equal to what? What x values do I have? Negative 3. Zero. Yep. Two. 2, 3, 4, 5. No, 2, 3, 4. Sorry. Negative 3, 0, 2, 3, 4. And then my range are all the y values where y equals what? Negative 3, 0, Four. That's what it's saying. Alright, are we okay with that so far from graph? Alright, now when you flip your paper over, we're still looking at graph, but this is part two of domain and range now. So this is actually we're gonna look more at equations. How do I find domain and range from special equations? So we want to look at four graphs before. You know most of these graphs. This first one is a linear function. We already saw this one today, so I'm gonna go kind of quick through the box. A linear function, what's the parent function? Y equals x. What did we say the domain of that linear function was? Negative infinity to infinity. We said it was all real numbers because it had arrows on the left and the right. What's the range of this line? Same thing, negative infinity to infinity, all real numbers. Right? Arrows in both directions. Even, odd, or neither. Odd. Okay, I'm not going to spend a ton of time there except to say linear functions are really nice because no matter what, any line... Your inputs and outputs, or like your domain and range is always all real numbers. It's really nice. This next one, what's the parent function for this? Do you remember what these, this family is called? 
the quad. Oh, well, they make parabolas, but it's actually called the quadratic. The quadratic. I know I'm, that doesn't make sense because linear function makes lines, quadratic functions make parabolas. All right. What's the domain of this parabola? I have an arrow on the left and an arrow on the right. Negative infinity to infinity. So for this parabola, I can pick any number, positive or negative, and put it in brackets here, and I'll get an answer. What's the range of this graph? Zero with a square bracket up to infinity. Now, why is that? Well, I, if I put even a negative number into x, when I square a number, what's the only kind of answer I can get? Positive or zero, right? I can never get a negative. That's what this graph means. There's no way to get a negative answer when I put a number in for x. Um, even higher meter. Even. All right, those are the two that we like. We're not going to worry too much about the equation for those and finding the domain because the domain is all real number for both. The bottom two graphs here, these are the ones we're going to focus a little bit more time on the domain with. This is a what? Do you remember the parent function for this one on the left? Square root of x. All right, so this is a square root function. That's the sample. Now, the square root function is a little bit different when we get to the equation. Um, what's the domain of the square root function? It's on the left. Zero with a square bracket to infinity. Yep, there's a parenthesis. So think about the square root function. Zero to infinity. Can I take the square root of zero? If I put zero in there. Does that work? Square root of zero is zero. Okay, I can take the square root of zero. Can I take the square root of any positive number? Yep. It might not be rational, but I can take the square root of any number. Why does it start at zero? What happens if I picked a number out to the left over here? I can't take the square root of like negative 8, or at least you don't know how yet. So that doesn't work. That's why our domain is restricted. Uh, the range, what's the lowest y value? 0, and the range goes up to infinity. Now, same kind of reason. When I take the square root of anything, have you ever taken a square root and gotten a negative answer? No. So that's why there's no negatives here. Nothing down below the axis because you can't have a negative number. Um, is that right? Even odd or neither? Neither. All right, last one. This is a parent function that you'll use in pre-calc a lot. We'll use the equations later this year, but not the graph. We'll do the graph next year. This is called a rational, I spelled it wrong, to be a rational function. So they're really cool. The graphs are fun. The parent function is y equals 1 over x. We looked a little bit at 1 over x and its variation when we did inverse it. Now, the cool thing about this graph is it uses my favorite math word. Do you remember what my favorite math word was? It starts with an A. Asymptotes. There are asymptotes on this graph. So if I talk about the domain, notice that the arrow on the left here is going out that way forever, right? There's lots of arrows, but this one goes out that way forever. And then this arrow on the right goes to the right forever. But here's where the problem happens. If I look here at the y-axis, there's, a, there's an asymptote there. Asymptotes are invisible. But there's an asymptote. So that means that this graph from both directions gets really close to the y-axis, but never actually touches it. So is there, that's at x equals 0, is there a value for x equals 0 on this graph? No, there's not. So I could use interval notation here, but it's, it's going to be way more complicated. I'm going to use set notation. I'm going to use my curly bracket because it's going to be a lot shorter. I want any x value in the world, all the x's. The only x that's not going to be in my domain is where that asymptote is, which is where x equals 0. But I want to say I want all the x's where x is not equal to 0, because that's my domain is saying what all the possible x values can be. It's anything but 0. Okay? Does that make sense? So the y is going to be similar. I have another asymptote here at the x-axis. So I go down forever, I go up forever, except I can't have a y of 0. So same type of range here. y, where all the y's are not equal to 0. Is that even odd or neither? Uh, now, we're not going to look at the graph for rational functions so much, but we need to know the rules. So there's some boxes at the bottom, and then we're almost done, I promise. 
do a couple of equations. We're going to use their equations to find the domain for these guys. Um, so for square root, so something like square root of x minus 6, I have to make sure that only positive number and 0 go under the square root. Okay, I cannot put a negative under that square root. Like, that can't be the whole thing. So, but here's how we do this. If you have an equation like this, you don't have a graph. You can always graph it on your calculator, but if you don't have a calculator, um, you are going to look at, we call it the radicand. That's a cool word I use a lot. The radicand is the thing under the radical. And that radicand can be positive, it can be zero, but it can't be negative. So the way we find the domain is to take the radicand and set it greater than or equal to zero. The greater than part means that that radicand on the left can be positive or it can be equal to zero. And so this is going to seem pretty simple while I'm going through it. But I've been teaching algebra 2 for like eight years and this is stuff that people always mess up because they forget either what symbol goes here or like they just forget how to do it. So this is something that seems really simple right now, but we're going to keep practicing it because it'll come back. It'll probably be on the ACT. You'll use missing calc and calc. Um, it's really important. All right, all I have to do to find the domain is add 6 to both sides. And then I get x is greater than or equal to 6. And the nice thing about that when I get an inequality here is I can pretty much put that right into set builder notation. I can just put my x, my bar, and my curly bracket. And there's my domain. Any number, 6, or where that's bigger than or equal to 6 will work. Okay, so what that means is, like, if I put 6 into this equation, equal to 6, I would have square root of 6 minus 6, which is square root of 0. That's okay. If I put bigger than 6, 10 into that equation, I have 10 minus 6, which is the square root of 4. I pick the square root of 4. Now, what's a number smaller than 6? 2. Okay, so if I put 2 into that equation, 2 minus 6, that's the square root of negative 4. Can I do that? No. Okay, do you see what that domain means right there? Then? It's what numbers I can plug into the equation for us. All right, last box here. This is a rational function. For rational functions, I have to make sure that the denominator... It's never equal to what in a fraction? What can the denominator never be? Zero. Zero. Right? My algebra one class was watching a video the other day. We were talking about slope. And the video is called Slope Dude. And Slope Dude said that anything with a denominator of zero is called undefined. And that is a curved coordinate. So we do not want this denominator here to be equal to zero. So when we find the domain, we take that denominator and say, okay, it can be anything, but it can't be zero. So we set it not equal to zero. And we're finding the one number that breaks the rule. The one bad number to make this denominator undefined. So all you have to do is subtract 3, and you end up with the answer of x cannot be what value? Negative 3. And then again, you can sneak those squiggly bars around. And that's your domain. Any x value except negative 3. If I put negative 3 in, that's bad. Okay? All right. Two more. I'm not even going to do all the problems on the back. I'm just going to pick two. There's a lot. I'm not going to do them all. Um, example 8. All rational functions. So the rule for every one of these is you're going to take the denominator and set it not equal to 0. So let's look at b. That denominator, x plus 3 times x minus 2, cannot equal 0. It can be anything but 0. So, we're going to talk more about the law I'm going to use in a minute, in the fall or the winter. <coughs> but we're going to use a rule right here called the zero product law. And the zero product law says if I have two factors, like I have here, like a factored form, set equal to 0, I can set them each equal to 0. Okay, so what you do is if you have factors, you're going to set each part not equal to zero. And then solve each equation separately. So if I had x plus 3 not equal to zero, what's the one x value that this can't be? If I solved it, negative 3. Okay, and then over here, I would add 2 and get x is not equal to 2. Okay. And that would be, I mean, you could do your set notation 
just like that, put a comma. There you go. That's your domain. All the x's can't be negative three or two. Yes. Yeah, for that one. And we'll talk more about that rule later in the year. You actually use the same thing really briefly in C. Um, C, if I set that denominator not equal to zero, the only thing that has to be here first, if you have like a squared on the left, you have to factor the left side. How would this side factor? Pull out an x. So the x times x plus 2 not equal to zero. And then you could do the same thing. You could set the x not equal to zero and the x plus 2 not equal to zero. And what would you get? What? Well, this is one of part of your domain. What's the other one? What can x be? Negative 2. I didn't write that for but Does that make sense for the rest? Last one, I'm just going to do one down here in example 9, and then we're all set for the day. <coughs> Under the square root, you can add negative. So, I'll, I'm going to do C, actually, but I'm going to set this one up. If I was trying to find the domain from this equation, what would I do with that radicate? Set it how? To zero. Greater than or equal to zero. And then you would solve. So what that does, let's do C together. For C, if I have negative 2x plus 8 is greater than or equal to 0, I'm just going to solve that inequality. So subtract 8. Get negative 2x is greater than or equal to negative 8. And then what happens when I divide by a negative? I switch the sign. Now, here, it's really easy. If I were going to write this in set notation, I would just stick that inequality in the brackets. The directions, however, say to use interval notation. So my suggestion, if I was going to do interval notation, coming from an inequality like this, would be to sketch a really quick picture. All right, think about a number line. If I have 4 on my number line here, which way is my arrow going if x is less than or equal to 4? left, right? So if I go to the left here, now it's a little bit easier to see how my interval has to go. Because that means my rate, my domain is going from negative infinity, all the x is smaller than or up to 4. Okay, so that would be the interval. So if you have trouble going from an inequality to an interval, sketch a little picture. Okay? I know that was a lot of notes today. You guys did a really nice job paying attention the whole time. There's a very, very 